chance has made my dreams come true. And I have given him what he desires most in return. And what's that? Every piece of me. Paul Thomas Anderson's Phantom Thread is a beautifully shot, intricately crafted story of a complex romance between the fashion designer Reynolds Woodcock and his muse and lover Alma. The film is based on various prominent fashion designers of the early 20th century, from their clothing to their own tumultuous love lives, as well as an experience the writer-director had when his own wife was taken care of him during a bout of illness. Buzzed by the title of this video, it's very easy to acknowledge that Reynolds definitely has some mummy or mama issues going on. The film's not purely about the Oedipal complex. There are a lot of psychoanalytical ideas to unpack here and I have subjected myself to a horrifying amount of them for the sake of this video. Before I go frame by frame and discuss Phantom Thread's Freudian themes, this video will contain spoilers and I cannot recommend enough how you should just Totally go into this film blind, knowing nothing about it, if you still know nothing about it, and just experience it firsthand. It's such a joy. So let's get on with it. The living arrangements of the siblings are odd, to say the least. We're never given a real date for when this takes place in, not even in a later New Year's Eve party scene, but it is safe to say the film takes place somewhere in a nice area of 1950s London. Reynolds is a man of finer details. His morning routine is painstakingly outlined to us as the workers flood in and return to their stations. As a man of such annoyingly pristine habits, it is no surprise when Jonah, the woman who looks to be his girlfriend, expresses her despair at his almost mechanical treatment of her, and it is equally of no shock when he confirms his disdain for her. I cannot begin my day with a confrontation, please. Despite Reynolds' clear annoyance with her, it's only later, at dinner and at Cyril's suggestion, can he finally, though voicelessly, admit his relationship has come to an end. In the midst of a difficult conversation regarding his love life, Reynolds makes the most logical, understandable connection ever to his late mother. Reynolds described to his sister dreams he has been having with their mother in them, as well as feeling her spiritual presence in the waking world. He ponders aloud what his mother may have made of his accomplishments, as Cyril looks at him with a glazed expression, as though this were a topic she has heard many times before. Whilst grieving your mum certainly isn't vindicating Freud in any way, the fact that she's discussed within a breath of Reynolds' failed, again air quotes, relationship, gives away that in his mind the role of mother and lover are closely linked. Saying that, the Oedipal implications of this scene aren't even the most interesting bits of psychoanalysis to delve into. An important thing to note is Reynolds is seeing her in his dreams. In traditional psychoanalytical theory, this would be seen as wish fulfilment, a process in which the subconscious is trying to perform a desire that is otherwise impossible to quench whilst awake. To some, this is a cathartic experience that helps them pinpoint what is lacking within their life, and some may choose to resolve this problem outside of their dreams. However, psychoanalyst James Hopkins argues that this positively regarded practice is actually detrimental to the dreamer's afflicted, writing, the illusion of which he as the author may, moreover, actually work to prevent his acting rationally. For so long as he imagines that he is drinking, he may be impeded from forming or acting on a real desire to drink. Therefore, when combined with Reynolds linking romantic and maternal love, this provides further evidence that his enduring desire for his mother is what prevents him from finding a long-term partner, as in his dreams, he can still find the only woman deserving of all his admiration, so why should he search the waking world for anyone else? Reynolds continues, Smelling her scent. The strongest sense that She's near us. This implies his wish to impress his mother extends beyond the dream realm, as it exists right over his shoulder and may further impede on his abilities to connect with romantic interests in a healthy manner. Looking out for a brother, or possibly disturbed by yet another indication of Reynolds' crush on their mother, Cyril suggests that he take a break to the bachelor pad or their country childhood home, out of the city. Is in a small cafe where Reynolds meets Alma, 
which is an awfully quick turnaround for a girlfriend. <laughs> this man is surely for the country cobbled streets, however, I'm not analysing whether being a mama's boy makes you any more of a future fan. Anyway, Reynolds insists Alma remember his order as he would like to see her notepads in which she wrote For the hungry boy, my name is Alma. But let's hold on to that thought for a second. Alma accepts a date with Reynolds and over a candlelit dinner he asks to see a picture of her mother. When she tells him no, very normally, like a normal person, I don't carry around pictures of my mother, Reynolds sees this as an invite to tell her that he's in fact brought Mummy Dearest on their date. Where's yours? Your mother? She's here in the canvas. What do you mean? You can sew almost anything into the canvas of a coat. <laughs> Secrets. Coins. Words. Little messages. When I was a boy, I started to hide things in the linings of the garments. Things that only I knew were there. And over my breast, I have a lock of my mother's hair to keep her close to me always. This information is then used to set up a later scene where Reynolds sews Alma's name into garments. Now, the hope is if you're watching this video, you are of the same opinion as me, where you can understand fashion as being a form of art. However, this isn't widely regarded in the traditional forms of art, so I'm going to have to justify it a bit here. Psychoanalyst Kenneth Wright said, A successful work of art is one that transforms the relatively inert material of the artist's medium into something alive that now contains or expresses an inner form. Now, before I delve any further, it's important to understand Freud thought that consciousness consisted of three distinct layers, known as the superego, ego and id. The superego. This is how we behave outwardly. For the most part, the behaviour and thoughts at this level are dictated by social acceptance and what we think those around us deem as virtuous and moral, even if we do not agree with these terms ourselves. The id is the one more associated with the subconscious. Sometimes the urges at this level are so shockingly grotesque, our brain makes an effort to stuff them away for fear of total shame and continued acceptance within our social group. The ego, despite being somewhat linked to topics like self-esteem and pride, is not entirely any of these things in psychoanalysis. It actually refers to a construct which regulates between the ids, primitive urges, and the societal demands of the superego. Given this brief overview of Freud's breakdown of the psyche, we can apply this to Reynolds' work. We understand that fashion appeals to our superego. Clothing has always been a way to define ourselves in the social hierarchy and fit in with our peers. In this case, it may seem there is nothing inner about its creation if it is only to fill the desires of society women. However, Reynolds' creations are not just for the women who wear them to be special. Townsend, 2015, citing Milner, 1969, described her own creative process when she felt, at times, there is a fusion between herself and her artwork. Applying this approach to Reynolds, we can determine that some, if not all, the articles of clothing made by him are a physical manifestation of his own psyche, and by extension, the secrets hidden within the insides of the garments represent his id. This would fulfil Wright's specification that art must be an expression of the inner self, thus also revealing Reynolds' mother and Alma as being subjects of deep, hidden desires of the id. For the second time, an Oedipal link can be drawn between the mother and romantic love in his mind, except now, instead of hindering his chances, as Freud would suggest, it subversely guides how he processes his attraction to Alma, as his creations are at this point his most external display of his affection towards her. This unconventional and quiet approach may be due to his lingering desire for his mother or his lack of a true committed experience with another woman, but most likely a combination of the both. Stop it! Where's your gun? Stop being a child. Where's your gun? Stop. Playing. Show me your gun. Stop playing this game. Rewind. This isn't the first time Alma has referred to Reynolds as being a child, yet differs greatly from the context of the scenes he has last occurred in. In a scene I wasn't able to show earlier on, 
Alma describes him to the doctor as... And then he's... He's a baby. He's like a spoiled little baby. This verbal subject positioning repeatedly performed by Alma indicates the very thing that has kept him attracted to her, her ability to recognise his wants and treat him like a child which he so craves due to his unresolved Oedipus complex. Having previously explained he has no recollection of his biological father and only in passing mentions his stepfather, Reynolds may have never underwent the fear of castration and identification with the father that resolves the phallic stage of development. A less well-known component of the Oedipus complex is its involvement with what Freud termed psychosexual development. Within this process, there were several distinct stages, with age ranges correlating to pleasure explored in a specific erogenous zone at that time. There were a number of things that could go wrong at every stage, such as a stage happening too early, too late, not getting enough exploration, getting too much, etc so forth, but even the tiniest infractions could stunt not only the growth into what was deemed a healthy sexual adult, though to be fair this is by Freud's 20th century standards, but the person's entire psyche. Whilst we commonly think of sexual development happening in puberty, Freud's theory of psychosexual development suggests the process begins much younger, almost from the moment that we are born. The phallic stage is thought to occur around the ages of 3 to 6 and it is where children are thought to recognise and distinguish themselves based on differences of anatomical sex. It is this realisation that kicks off the Oedipus complex, which is then resolved before the beginning of the latent stage. However, if there's no resolution, the consequences of prolonging the stage can be dire, as it is this stage where the superego should be formed and is often done so through the child becoming fearful of castration from the father figure. Without this fear of castration which could oppose the child's desire for the mother figure, this attraction can become a perversion in adulthood due to a lack of repression found in those with underdeveloped superegos. The absence of a superego can also lead to traits such as narcissism and aggression, which are both traits displayed by Reynolds and identified in him by Alma. Also, another interesting thing I found during this research is that this line kind of seems to come out of nowhere. You don't wish to share that life as apparently it's so disagreeable to you in every respect. Why don't you just fuck off to back where you came from? However, when I was researching to see if any critics had done any extended takes focusing on the theme of the Oedipus complex, I stumbled across a the interview with Paul Thomas Anderson where he suggests that Reynolds and Cyril's mother is also an immigrant herself, which at this point is shocking, I know. <laughs> any romantic partner would run at this point, but Alma is no longer just a lover, she is the mother or she really, really wants to be, so she can reap what it's really like being the lover. There weren't many women who were around during the height of psychoanalysis to provide information on how these mental processes might differ from a male brain, though Sabina Spielring was one of them. As a student of Freud, Spielring faced criticism from him as her evidence, an already scant commodity in the field of psychoanalysis, relied mostly on personal anecdotes and mythology, as well as storytelling, which... It's kind of what I'm doing now. Anyway, Spearing took special interest in the topics of destruction and love, and in her book Destruction as the Cause of Coming Into Being, describes love as being split into a relationship between subject and object. In this relationship, one is the subject and loves the externally projected object, one becomes the beloved and loves the self as the object. Heterosexually, the subject was often the man, subjecting his female partner to his love, and she would love herself and feel complete through his admiration of being the beloved. Now it may seem initially that by Reynolds offering Alma this life of fashionable extravagance and making her feel elegant through his designs, they would fit within this definition. However, Spielrein also notes that the roles of subject and object have a destructive part that is intrinsic to their being and is not separate from their loving components, writing, the subject wants to destroy the love object so as to merge their egos. Despite Reynold Cole put-downs, it is ultimately Alma who possesses more tangible destructive urges evidenced by her decision shortly after this argument to poison him with mushrooms. It's obvious to look at Alma's decision to poison Reynolds as a desperate, hastily calculated attempt to cling to love or engage in a toxicity tit for tat, 
but this behaviour instead reflects who's truly the subject and object within the relationship. It doesn't take long before Reynolds starts feeling the effects of the mushroom and at the most convenient moment hits the deck. Alma insists she is the one to take care of him, despite Cyril's insistence that a doctor should examine his health. Alma wins, with Reynolds not too yes, feeble no. support. I admit I do look young. But Fuck I off. Soon, in a fever fueled hallucination, Reynolds sees his mother again, standing ever silently in her wedding dress. She lingers for a moment when Alma opens the door to check his temperature, but vanishes when his attention is caught by Alma's approach to his bedside. Before our eyes, we see her replace the space that Reynolds' mother occupies, not just physically, but in Reynolds' own heart. Beyond the psychoanalytical implications of Alma physically replacing the mother, this moment is so haunting yet so subtly done and whilst there are moments that rise above this in terms of emotion, it is this scene I still think about all these rewatches later. I still feel an edge, completely contrary to how Reynolds feels at this moment and I don't just believe I'm horror movie pals. Paul Thomas Anderson talked about the core idea for the film that came with him first, which was a film about a man who can only express his love when he is ill. I don't believe I'm simply scared by ghosts and I'm not touched by the most blatant visual Freudian metaphor in the film. I'm moved by a man who, only when he thinks he's on the brink of death, can truly express the thoughts and feelings that make any of our lives worth living. The scene in terms of visuals does not stand alone, as well as the verbal subject positioning it that I mentioned earlier. So many shots utilise blocking and cinematography techniques to diminish Reynolds' presence within Alma's and she extends far above him and she dominates the frame, though usually in very soft, caring ways. On completion of the dress the next morning, you see Reynolds propose to a sleepy Alma, cementing the future that was largely uncertain due to the issues on both parties. Many might consider the couple's efforts and time spent with the dress as foreshadowing to their marriage. However, I believe if it were not for the brief appearance of Reynolds' mother at the arrival of Alma, he may not have fully recognised the specific effort that she makes in their relationship, especially on behalf of his care. So. Alma's plan works, but not all is necessarily well. Alma quickly loses both her charm and her motherly veneer, which irritates Reynolds. He may have shifted his affection onto a more appropriate, sustainable love object, but he did not grow beyond the conditions set by his stunted psychosexual development. He is embarrassed publicly for the behaviour of his young wife and her desire to expand her circle beyond him, Cyril and her fellow colleagues. As tired as she is of the walls of their home, Reynolds tires of her juvenile habits and he himself being forced into the role of caretaker when he drags her from a New Year's Eve party. Reynolds simply isn't cut for the life of romantic parenthood that he so craves to be on the receiving end of and threatens to banish Alma from their work and home. And so, Alma returns to poisoning her now husband, though now far more sure and determined in her plan of action. She is bolder. She makes an omelette with mushrooms visibly cut through it, rather than the subtle method of poisoning by tea. However, Reynolds reveals he knows what she is doing and proceeds to eat his food anyway so that Alma can begin taking care of him again. This displays a strange crossover of the psychoanalytical idea of the Eros and Thanatos, or libido and death drives. The idea of a libido drive, also known as the pleasure principle, was first theorised by Freud in 1895, but wouldn't receive its name until much later in 1911. Despite the name's seeming innuendo, the concept is just about humans first and foremost putting their own pleasure above all else in whatever form it may come in. Freud believed that the pleasure came from a release and tension, which if left to build would result in a number of unpleasantries. However, it wasn't long before he ran into contradictions. 
The principal was not compatible with the various veterans of war he met who were plagued with nightmares from their service, and the same was true for his non-service neurotics, who would feel compelled to repeatedly divulge their own traumas through risky behaviour, despite the distress it caused. These realisations led to Freud conceiving of the death drive, which was not a new idea, but was popularised when he began discussing it in 1920 with the release of his book Beyond the Pleasure Principle. In it, Freud suggests a more physical interpretation of the death drive compared to those who came before him, suggesting that the aim of all life is death and looking backwards, that inanimate things existed before living ones. This explanation for why we as humans, as well as the characters, engage in potential self-destructive behaviours makes total sense when considering how Freud thought excitement was detrimental to our own pleasure, as there is no more tension to fail to release and feel disappointment in if we are dead. Alma, like what we commonly associate with a romantic partner, is able to participate in Reynolds' actions driven by the pleasure principle. However, she is also able to go above and beyond this and satiate the death drive by rendering him ill near to the point of immobilisation. At this point, further analysis can be drawn by returning to earlier, more psychological interpretations of the death drive. Our favourite gal, Sabina Sperling, is thought to have inspired her mentor Freud with her own theories on the death instinct, which were detailed alongside her theories on the object and subject back in 1911. Rather than attempting to render life back to its physical inanimate origins, Sperling suggested that the death instinct was a desire to destroy the ego. One scenario in which Spielring suggested the destruction of the ego could take place is where love reigns, the ego, the ominous despot dies. When one is in love, the blending of the ego and the beloved is the strongest affirmation of self, a new ego existence in the person of the beloved. When he relinquished his ability to choose by following Alma's desire to make him ill, Reynolds is seen at his most passionate and demonstrates total decimation of his individual ego, which has been the source of the conflict throughout the film. Considering the theories of both Freud and Spielring, the potent unbreakable bond between the couple can be fully understood rather than what I, and I'm assuming many others saw it in their first watch, which was, God, these people are so weird. Is this even healthy? And yes, despite how abnormal it is to poison your significant other, it's this dangerous though regulated behaviour that allows Reynolds to overcome the limitations set by the Oedipal complex and express his true emotions in a more sincere and healthy manner. It's needless to say at this point that Phantom Thread is one of my favourite movies ever and for all I've talked at length about its presentation and discussion of psychoanalytical ideas, that's not what made it a favourite of mine. I could say it's one of the number of things I noticed first about it, the palpability of their love despite their extraneous flaws, or how that score transforms the world around me no matter where I walk. But what this film has, like all films I truly love, is something new to discover every time I revisit it. It's like it grows with me, with a new lesson or message most appropriate for whenever I rewatch it. Words of truth, words of solace, whatever I may need. The truth is, however, the film really doesn't change at all. Its messages are static, though hidden like secrets in the lining of clothes, just waiting to be discovered. <laughs>